This presentation describes the rationale for the use of magnesium in B1 therapy in Parkinson's, also known as the high dose thiamine therapy protocol. I will cover topics such as the magnesium deficiency, magnesium serum concentrations, risk factors for magnesium deficiency, screening for magnesium deficiency, expected consequences of a deficiency in magnesium, forms of magnesium supplements, doses of magnesium, interaction of magnesium with other medicines, interference of magnesium with searching for the right dose of vitamin B1. The B1 therapy protocol consists of three key elements, thiamine, vitamin B1, magnesium, and B vitamins. By the end of this presentation, you will be able to understand the importance of magnesium deficiency and of its management in Parkinson's. Let's start with magnesium deficiency. Magnesium intake from the diet is often inadequate to meet the nutritional needs of a person. Population studies have confirmed these findings times and times again in different countries across borders. Furthermore, there is a marked decrease in recent times in content of macronutrients, including magnesium, in food because of agriculture practices and food refining processes. One way magnesium deficiency is assessed is by measuring serum concentrations, both in population studies and in clinical practice. When we talk about magnesium concentrations in the body, we have to remember that magnesium is an intracellular cation. Less than 1% of total body magnesium is in the serum. Therefore, serum total magnesium concentrations do not reflect intracellular magnesium. It's also a priority of our body to keep the levels of magnesium in the serum normal. So even in the presence of magnesium deficiency, serum magnesium values can be normal. But what are these normal values? Currently, serum magnesium laboratory reference values range from 0.75 to 0.95 millimoles per liter. These values were derived from normal population, but included also people who had subclinical magnesium deficiency. This meaning people who were deficient in magnesium but did not display clinical signs. Lower limit of this reference range is also associated with many medical conditions. It's a risk factor to be considered. Physicians, therefore, should be alerted to the fact that values at the current lower limit of the reference range may indicate magnesium deficiency. A cutoff point for lower limit of the reference range of 0.85 millimoles per liter may already be associated with increased health risk. Different technical groups in, in countries are considering, in fact, reviewing the cutoff points set as normal values range for magnesium. What are the risk factors for magnesium deficiency? First of all, aging. As we grow older, the intake of magnesium from the diet decreases, we absorb less, we eliminate more, with the resulting negative net balance. Another risk factor is vitamin D deficiency. Vitamin D deficiency is highly frequent in persons with Parkinson's, and it is even more common in Parkinson's than it is in the control population. Vitamin D deficiency reduces gastrointestinal absorption of magnesium. Medicines are often prescribed for common conditions. Some of the medicines tend to reduce the absorption of magnesium, therefore contributing to the potential development of a magnesium deficiency status. Some of the medicines use the same transport system of metabolic pathways as magnesium. Others create unfavorable uh, conditions to absorption. For example, 
proton pump inhibitors like omeprazole, or esomeprazole, pantoprazole, and the like, they, they modify the acid environment which helps absorption of magnesium. Antibiotics like aminoglycoside antibiotics such as centamycin, tobramycin, and so on, diuretics like thiazide diuretics, furosemide, antihypertensive medicines are all examples of a long list of medicines which may interfere with magnesium absorption. Polypharmacy in Parkinson's is common. Polypharmacy means that a person with Parkinson's tend to introduce many medicines at the same time. This is due to the coexistence of medical conditions in Parkinson's. Another important risk factor is a condition such as diabetes mellitus, both type 1 and type 2, which is often accompanied by magnesium deficiency because of increased urine excretion. Now, in diabetic patients, magnesium deficiency is associated with a reduced release of insulin and increased resistance to insulin. In non-diabetic patients, magnesium deficiency is associated with an increased risk of developing diabetes. Now, this last point is very important. Now, this is very important in Parkinson's because in Parkinson's there is an alteration of glucose metabolism represented by a reduced tolerance to glucose and an increase in insulin resistance exacerbated by levotopa, even in the presence of normal blood sugar levels. And the, the alteration in glucose metabolism is as associated with worsening symptoms and disease progression. A fifth risk factor in this list is gastrointestinal disorders. We have examples such as chronic or prolonged diarrhea with or without malabsorptions, Crohn's disease, celiac disease, gastrointestinal surgery, and so on. Chronic alcoholism is also a factor which tend to lead to the development of magnesium deficiency. In the presence of unexplained hypokalemia and hypocalcemia, a physician should be alerted to the possibility that in that patient there is magnesium deficiency. Last, magnesium concentrations have been found low in the brains of people with Parkinson's in many studies. How do we screen for magnesium deficiency? When developing our screening tool for magnesium deficiency in Parkinson's, we go back to our list of risk factors. So we first ask about age, aging being one risk factors as uh, one of the risk factors as we've seen, which we check for alcohol intake, we collect the clinical history, we've seen some medical conditions are associated with an increased risk for magnesium deficiency, and also we check for uh, uh, for drug history for the same reasons we have seen the many medicines may be associated with an increased risk for magnesium deficiency. We perform certain lab tests to assess blood creatinine levels as an indicator of renal function. In the presence of impaired renal function, in fact, magnesium should not be provided, should not be taken unless it is prescribed by a medical professional and it is monitored very closely. We check for blood glucose. We have seen the role played by diabetes or glucose intolerance in magnesium deficiency. We check for vitamin D3. We have seen how common it is as a condition in Parkinson's and also it's, we have seen its association with magnesium deficiency. We check for serum and urinary magnesium. Why to check also the urine for magnesium concentration? Because when there is a deficiency in magnesium, the body tries to reduce the amount which is secreted to compensate. So having both serum and urinary magnesium concentrations as a lab test allow, allow, would allow us to have a better picture according to some authors. And then we check serum electrolytes, sodium, potassium, calcium, phosphate. But what, we are talking so much about magnesium deficiency, but why is it so important? 
what are the expected consequences of a situation of magnesium deficiency. Over 300 enzymes require magnesium as cofactor, a cohelper, for their action. 300 enzymes, so all related processes, metabolic processes, are, are likely to be affected by reduction in magnesium. Also, magnesium plays an essential role in reactions which require ATP, energy metabolism, and synthesis of nucleic acid, fats, and proteins. Magnesium is needed for normal functioning of the nervous and cardiovascular systems, for blood glucose control, blood pressure controls, uh, homeostasis of calcium and potassium metabolism, and so on. Magnesium plays many important roles. Therefore, it is plausible to expect that a deficiency in magnesium may have some important consequences. Then we have thiamine, which requires magnesium to be converted into the active form TPP so as to perform its functions as a cofactor for many enzymatic processes involved in key reactions in the cell, including the production of energy. It is therefore plausible to expect an increased need for magnesium with a substantial increase in thiamine intake which occurs in B1 therapy. Which forms of magnesium supplements are available? There are many different forms of magnesium supplements available in the market. Uh, they've been studied uh, extensively. Unfortunately, the studies have not used a standard methodology which makes them comparable. In general, organic forms are preferred. They have a better bioavailability meaning they have better absorption and better delivery to the target organ. Let's start with magnesium oxide, a cheap form of magnesium supplement. It's an inorganic form which, like other inorganic forms of magnesium, provides a high percentage of elemental magnesium, 60%, but at the same time it has a very low water solubility and which translates in, a, in very poor bioavailability, only 4%. It does have some laxative effects, which are welcomed by people with Parkinson's, in whom constipation is a very common symptom, which affects the quality of life. There is some evidence from few studies conducted in animal models, rats, and humans, about the possibility that magnesium oxide interacts with carbidopa levodopa, degrading it. Until such time as more information is available about these in potential interactions, b1parkinsons.org does not recommend magnesium oxide in Parkinson's disease. Another well-known form of magnesium is magnesium sulfate. It is inexpensive, like magnesium oxide is an inorganic form of magnesium which contains a high percentage of elemental magnesium about 10 to 20 percent once introduced it dissociates quickly in the intestine it is a low it has a low bioavailability and a laxative effect for which it is well known magnesium sulfate may have an interaction with oral levodopa carbidopa in the sense that it may increase the levodopa therapeutic efficacy. B1Parkinson's.org does not recommend the use of magnesium sulfate in people with Parkinson's. We now have four different forms of magnesium which are presented on slides with a green background because they have a good bioavailability. Let's start with magnesium threonate, an expensive form of magnesium which provides 7 to 8% of elemental magnesium, which has good water solubility, good bioavailability. It has become famous, well known, and popular because studies have shown in animal models that it crosses the blood brain barrier. Some of other effects that magnesium threonate has may therefore be linked to this particular feature the improvement in cognitive ability and memory. 
B1Parkinson's.org regards magnesium threonate, a promising form of magnesium for use in Parkinson's disease with the potential to improve cognitive ability and memory. Now we say promising because studies on its use are at their infancy and also more has to be studied on its safety profile with chronic use in conditions like Parkinson's disease. Next is magnesium glycinate, which is an expensive form of magnesium, which provides 10 to 14% of elemental magnesium. It does have good water solubility and a very good bioavailability. It is a form in which magnesium is chelated to the amino acid glycine, which may account for, at least partially, for the good bioavailability. At the same time, there is some evidence for glycine that it may cross the blood-brain barrier. Other effects of magnesium glycinate may be associated with the effects that glycine has on anxiety, sleep and short memory loss. B1Parkinson's.org regards magnesium glycinate as another promising form of magnesium for Parkinson's disease with the potential to improve anxiety, sleep and short memory, all symptoms which are present and common in Parkinson's disease. Magnesium malate is a moderately expensive organic form of magnesium which provides 6 to 17 percent of elemental magnesium. It has good water solubility and a good bioavailability. In this form of magnesium, magnesium is combined with malic acid, which is an intermediate of the Krebs cycle which produces energy. Among other effects, in fact, it is reported that magnesium malate may improve energy. B1Parkinson's.org regards magnesium malate as a promising form of magnesium with a good bioavailability and with the potential to improve energy. And last we have magnesium citrate, which is a very popular form of magnesium because not only does it have a good bioavailability, a good absorption and delivery to the target organs, but also it, it does have some mild laxative effects which are welcome by persons with Parkinson's in which constipation is a major symptom which affects the quality of life. B1Parkinson's.org conclusions are that it helps raise magnesium levels in Parkinson's and may help also with constipation. What about doses of magnesium supplements? There are currently no guidelines on the doses of magnesium to, to provide, to prevent or correct magnesium deficiency in Parkinson's and to support high dose thiamine therapy at the same time. Meanwhile, it is advisable to use doses which are below the magnesium tolerable upper intake level, which is a level unlikely to pose a risk of adverse reactions in people with a normal renal function. The Food and Nutrition Board in the US has set this upper level to 350 mg per day, while the European Food and Safety Agency has set this level for Europe at 250 mg per day. The dose should take into account, in principle, a number of factors, such as the magnesium status of the individual, the dose of thiamine which is given, and the persistence of risk factors which are associated with a reduced intake of magnesium, a reduced absorption or increased excretion of magnesium, conditions such as the elderly, or chronic conditions such as diabetes, or chronic use of medicines. Does magnesium interact with other medicines? Magnesium can indeed interact with many medicines, so in principle it is easier and safer to apply the rule to take magnesium at least two hours apart from other medicines. Does magnesium interfere with the search for right, the right B1 dose in high-dose thiamine therapy? Well, magnesium deficiency 
clinically shares signs common to Parkinson's disease as well, making the search for the right dose of thiamine in high-dose thiamine therapy more challenging, unless this deficiency is corrected from the start. Now we need further research to evaluate the role of magnesium and magnesium supplementation in Parkinson's and for the high-dose thiamine protocol. Thank you for listening. This presentation is for information and education purposes only. In no way does it represent medical advice for which a healthcare professional should be consulted. Any actions taken based on what is contained in this presentation is the sole responsibility of the viewer.